Hey everybody, it's your old pal Mike. I hope you're happy, healthy, and safe, and welcome back to the channel, because this week, oh, we have a very special episode for you. Uh, this week, I'm going to be tackling this fantastic old Fender Jagstang. Now, this guitar actually belongs to someone that I went to high school with. His name is Tony, and he has passed it on to his child, Port, who is just learning to play guitar. Very exciting time for him and for all of us, really. Um, because anybody that discovers music and, and latches onto it, well, that's, that's a net positive for the world, I think. However, this guitar, it doesn't play so great. It's got a couple of uh, playability issues, including a neck that needs some adjustment. Uh, the bridge has fallen a little bit, so we'll need to adjust that. Also, the vibrato is not quite dependable, although I will argue until I'm Daphne Blue in the face that the Fender Dynamic Vibrato, a.k.a the Mustang vibrato is a perfectly workable vibrato, and with a little bit of setup tweaking, it works beautifully. So in this week's episode, we're gonna dive into that topic, as well as many more, including some electronics issues that I absolutely need to repair, and hopefully we're gonna end up with a guitar that is not just playable, not just tuneful, but a guitar that gets out of the way of port so that he can learn to play guitar and express himself without thinking about how difficult something is to play. That is, I find, maybe the number one deterrent for people uh, who want to learn the guitar but just can't keep with it. Think about it. If you've got to fight your instrument the whole way tooth and nail, well, for some people, that's, that's just a deal breaker. And I totally understand, which is why I'm here to help. Now, fundamentally, the Jagstang is a great guitar, so I think we're starting from a good place. The guitar just needs a little bit of help to be the best that it can be. So, without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, and we're back. Uh, while while the transition has been instantaneous for you, uh, friends, in real time, it has been seven hours since the introduction of this video. Uh, our car decided to die. And then it just took forever for the tow truck driver to arrive. So, you know, um, cars are the worst. <laughs> except when they work, and they're pretty okay. Uh, oh, fun fact, the tow truck driver, when he finally arrived, uh, actually ended up being really cool, and we started talking about guitars, and he told me a lovely story about Zach Wilde being really cool to his kid. And I love hearing stories like that, because if there's one thing I've learned from working in the business and being in the L.A. area, working for some well-known people, it's that um, there are a lot of... Really lovely people in this business, a lot more than you might think, especially people who have built a career on looking or sounding super tough. Oftentimes they are the nicest people in the world. Got a Mr. Rogers moment coming. <laughs> uh, but no matter, we are here. We're back. I'm ready to dig in on this Jagstang and get my mind off of what promises to be a very large repair bill. Uh, but that's okay. Let's talk about this Jagstang and repairs, because this thing needs some work. Now, as I mentioned before, there are some electronics issues, uh, although not nearly as bad as I was told. Tony told me that the pickup switch for the bridge pickup didn't work, and it absolutely does, uh, but it is intermittent. So I'm going to have to clean that out, maybe do some soldering. We'll see when we get in there. Now, the second thing I really want to take care of on this great guitar is just the overall setup. Now, I think this could use some refinement as far as consistency across the fretboard and up and down the neck is concerned. Also, the bridge has collapsed on one side, which leads me to believe that it's just kind of rattled its way loose over a long period of time. So we'll address that. That's easy enough to fix. I'm going to focus the bulk of my efforts on the vibrato because the guitar is having a little bit of trouble, not too much, uh, coming back into tune after use. Now let's say I strum an E chord. <laughs> reasonably in tune, right? Let's actuate the vibrato. 
Not quite. Not quite there. But if I pull up on the vibrato just a little bit after using it, that's a lot better. Just like the Jazzmaster and Jaguar vibrato, getting these to work is all about finding equilibrium, a balance between string tension and spring tension. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that over the course of this episode. Now, why don't I get these strings off and we'll do some exploring, all right? Yeah. Now, those of you who have never encountered a Mustang style vibrato before might be a little confused about how it's strung. Uh, I have on many, many, many occasions gone to um, very well-known Hollywood guitar shops and see Mustangs on the wall that are strung entirely the wrong way. <laughs> so we're going to demystify that for you right here. First, I'm going to remove the vibrato arm. Now, what you'll notice is that these strings are actually fed around and underneath the tailpiece, uh, what we offset aficionado enjoy calling a cigar, because it is, it is kind of shaped like a cigar. And before we get too deep into things, let me just demonstrate how you string these. First, the string is fed from the bridge side of the tailpiece or cigar, and the ball end is anchored within it. And then we just bend that string and feed it underneath the cigar and string it up as usual. That's how this works. You'd be surprised, honestly, you'd be surprised by how many people don't know that. Or maybe we shouldn't be surprised at all because these aren't everyday guitars for most people the way they are for me. Uh, and look, it's totally okay not to know things. That's why we're all here to learn together. I'm gonna take the bridge off and yeah, looks like that screw. Yeah, it's pretty loose in the post. So if you weren't aware, offset bridges are adjusted via an Allen key inserted in the hole in the bridge post here. And all you do is you twist it a little bit to get that screw to come out further and that, yeah, that raises the height of the bridge. Easy enough, a lot of people, they don't know that little guy's there. A lot of people don't know that. So for the sake of your edification, I'm going to remove the vibrato and we're gonna have a look at how it works. All right, so, ooh, you're a little stuck, huh? So what we've got under the vibrato is the cigar that we mentioned earlier. Well, connected to the cigar are these two springs. Now this is where all of the backward tension is coming from. These springs are meant to counteract string tension. So when the strings pull on the cigar, it pulls forward like so. So the real trick with the dynamic vibrato is to find equilibrium i.e. where the strings and the springs are counterbalancing each other perfectly so that when you actuate the vibrato, it pulls back into tune. All right, let's run through all the parts on the dynamic vibrato so that we're starting on the same page, that we're all using the same terminology. All right, first up, we've got the body mounting plate, which is what sits on the body and keeps everything secure. We've got the tailpiece, AKA the cigar, which is an absolutely perfect name for it. it, really is shaped like that. Now the cigar is mounted to these little adjustable posts. A lot of people don't realize that inside this hole is another screw for you to adjust, which governs the overall height of the cigar. And that is a crucial part of setup, by the way. Now on these posts are these little knife edge cutouts, which is what makes contact with the body plate. That's where the whole mechanism pivots. And to these posts, you'll notice, are mounted some springs. Now these springs clearly are doing the spring work, the heavy lifting, but you'll also notice these three ridged cutouts here that they're mounted to. Now these little cutouts or notches are how you're meant to change the overall spring tension of the unit. Say that you step up a gauge of string and you notice that your vibrato is pulling forward way too far. Well, you'd move this loop of the spring up a notch or maybe two notches if you need even more spring tension. And spring tension is increased because now the spring has to stretch further between its two mounting points here and here. So if you have a Mustang vibrato that feels rather sloppy or loose, or simply has trouble pulling back into tune with heavier string gauges, well, you might wanna have a look at which notches your springs are mounted to, because this can make a huge difference. And because this guitar is going to be mainly used by a beginner to intermediate player, I think we're just gonna stick with where these are now, because we're not stepping up a string gauge. I think we're just gonna use tens on this to keep it easy to play for the student. 
Uh, if I were stepping up a gauge, I would probably put these on the middle of the post at the very least. All right, let's dig in on these electronics before we move on. And let's have a look. Well, nothing seems untoward here, but you know, I'm just gonna do due diligence and clean out these switches because they are, they are looking a little bit crispy, aren't they? So what I'm gonna do is lay down a towel underneath the pick guard, get out my contact cleaner and spray out these electronics just to make sure that they're working and sliding and operating the way that they should. I'm also going to reflow all the solder joints for good measure because clearly they haven't been touched in a long time. And I just wanna make sure that everything is as right as possible. All right, so I'm using regular old CRC contact cleaner. I'm just gonna wipe away all of that whitish corrosion as much as I can, at least. Anything I can do to stop that or slow it down, the happier I am. You know, eventually parts break and wear out. That's not a big deal. But while I'm in here, I'm gonna make sure that it all works. And I'm also gonna spray some inside and operate the switches a few times through the full range of their motion just to clean out any other corrosion. Let's use our trusty Weller soldering iron. And I'm just gonna quickly reflow all the solder joints just to make sure they work. Solder joints, if you didn't know, can they can actually go bad. They can corrode, they can become brittle, and break over time. All kinds of good reasons to periodically update them. And to reflow joints, all you need is a little bit of heat and just a little bit of new solder, which tends to reflow the old very quickly. Just a little bit. We're just making sure that everything's right. And we're gonna screw it all back in. And you know, I think I'll do the same for the pots as well while I'm here. Spray them out. Make sure they're all working nicely. And every time you spray, you should always rotate those pots a good number of times just to make sure that they're getting cleaned. And you can even feel them loosen up just a little bit. All that dirt getting out of there, that is great. Yeah, those feel nice. They weren't very scratchy earlier, but you know, better safe than sorry. These joints actually look pretty darn good to me. They might not need this, but... Now, if this were a touring instrument or going to be used in a studio, I would probably recommend replacing these pots because they're not very good. While Japanese guitars are great. The wood is great. The guitars are great. Sometimes the electronics can... Well, they can leave much to be desired, is how I'll put that. Uh, those little alpha pots just are not up to the task. Uh, you are often losing something in translation. You are losing a little bit of output and some high end. You are losing a little bit of usability. But now is not the time for such discussion. Now is the time for making ports play experience as enjoyable as possible. And I'm all too happy to make that happen. Now I'm gonna pause here to polish up the body. As you can see, it's pretty dirty and gross filled with fingerprints, and it did come a little bit dirty to me, uh, but now that I've touched it a bunch, well, you know, fingerprints, they happen. So let me spray this body down, polish it out, and then we'll continue on. All right, now that I've got it all polished up, I'm going to start on the setup. But before I do, I need to remove the neck so that I can see what's going on within the neck pocket. Now this already seemed to have an adequate amount of neck pitchback, allowing us to raise the bridge and thus increase downward force on the saddles, keeping the strings in place. That is crucial for any offset guitar using the stock bridge. However, I think it could be improved, and maybe not, but the bridge was in such a state that I really couldn't get a sense of what the guitar needed. So I'm gonna take a look and see if the neck is shimmed, and if it is, I might add another. I may not, we'll see. All right, so this guitar, does not have a shim. Now, the best way to determine whether or not an offset needs a shim is to simply check how it's playing. If you can dig in hard and the strings stay in place, chances are your guitar is shimmed properly. But if you're having issues with the strings slipping around or the saddles rattling, then you may in fact need a little bit more downward pressure on it. So the best way to do that is to install a shim. And so it was that at this point in the video, 
my focus right scarlet just died. As a result, I lost a little bit of footage with some audio uh, that's just gone. So, um, I don't know, I don't know what I did, universe, but, uh, am I cursed? Let's get back to the Jagstang and finalize this so we can move on with our lives. Sound good? Let's do it. So, I believe when last we spoke, or when last you could hear me, uh, I was about to shim this guitar, and so I've reinstalled the bridge just to check whereabouts it was in terms of height so that I can see what's going on in the body. Now that is a good amount of height, but I do remember the action just being a little bit too high. So I think I'm going to install a very slim shim on this one using my little mastery box full of baseball and Star Trek cards. Now, a lot of people, they wanna argue that uh, cardstock shims are bad and, you know, for good measure, because over the years, Fender has used cardstock shims in a lot of their American vintage guitars, and those can compress. Those can change a little bit over time. Now, the Stumac shims, they are absolutely uh, preferred. Uh, having a piece of wood in there, full pocket coverage, that's a good thing. That's good for resonance. That's good for transfer. That's good for peace of mind. But in a pinch, a cardstock shim, like a baseball card, which does not compress, is vastly preferable. And you also get the added bonus of the knowledge that uh, Locutus of Borg is hiding right there in your uh, neck pocket. So, you know, who, who doesn't love that? So let's make a shim. I'm pretty sure you can see this. All I'm gonna do is cut off a sliver of Patrick Stewart's lovely visage and cut it down to size. Now I kind of know what the size of a neck pocket is at this point, so, you know, it's not really a concern. I like to cut off the edges, like so, in triangular sort of fashion, so that I can really get deep into the neck pocket there. And the reason I'm choosing to use one of these instead of the Stumac shims is that I don't need quite as much pitch back on the neck as the Stumac shims, even the smallest one provides. I don't need a full quarter of a degree, I need just a little bit, and a little bit is safe. Now, if you start stacking these, you might want to consider getting a Stu Mac full pocket shim or equivalent, but if you just need a little bit of pitch back on a guitar like this, that's going to work out just fine. So let's have a look at how much angle I've built into the guitar. I'm just going to fit the neck in the pocket and grab a straight edge just so I can see what's going on. Now the straight edge will allow me to envision the alignment of the end of the neck to the bridge, and it looks like, well, it looks like they meet perfectly. This is just hitting the front of the saddles, which means that action is going to be relatively low when I finally string it up, enabling me to raise the bridge just a little bit to increase downward force. And all of that adds up to a real good time on an offset guitar. I think we're gonna live with that. I am going to tweak the neck just a little bit because I also noticed a little bit of relief. And relief can be a really good thing on most guitars. It's a, it's a decent thing to have in your neck. It ensures that you won't have excessive rattle as you move up the neck. However, when it comes to offset guitars with a pitched back neck, a good amount of relief can actually read as an upward slope toward the strings, causing excessive buzz and fretting out issues. When it comes to offset guitars, I always recommend running the neck as straight as possible. So now that the neck is straightened, I'm going to gently reinstall the neck. I'm going to take a moment to polish the frets and oil the fretboard so that we have a beautiful instrument. And normally I like to do this with the neck off if I'm going to take it off already, but uh, yesterday went the way it went and uh, my mind is still out of sorts. So to prevent any steel wool from getting on the pickup, because that's not good at all, that can kill a pickup easily, I'm just going to tape over it. And just gently polish the fretboard. Get away all that gunk and grime that's built up. And now I'm just going to give it a light drink of oil. Just a little bit of oil. You don't want to do too much. Just a little drink to hydrate that fretboard. Now, oh, I'd say it's time for strings. 
As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be sticking with 10s for Port because he's still a new guitar player, still learning his way around the fretboard, and I want to make sure that this guitar is as easy as possible to play so he can just focus on learning the instrument and not worry about how difficult it is to play or that it's going out of tune. All of these things can be detrimental to a new student, and uh, I certainly don't want to advance that problem. I want to fix it. So I'm going to throw on some Ernie Ball regular slinkies. As I said before, to string a Mustang style vibrato, you actually want to come through from the front, i.e. the pickup side of the cigar. And then all you do is feed the string underneath the cigar, preferably holding in the ball end so that it doesn't shift around. But you don't have to do much. You just kind of have to pull it to tension. Like all Fender headstocks, I measure three tuners past the one that I'm stringing and cut. And that ensures that I will get more than enough winding around the tuning post, which is crucial for a Clouson style tuner. You feed the string into the hole in the center of the tuning shaft and you wind downward. I had a thought while I was stringing that I didn't use any thread locking agent on the post that seemed to have sank over time. And I just want to make sure that that doesn't happen again. So I'm going to use a little bit of blue Loctite on the threads and I'll show you how I do it. What you're meant to do is simply flow a little bit of Loctite onto the threads of a screw that you want to freeze in place. Now this stuff isn't permanent. You'll be able to break this with just a little bit of heat or even just a little bit of effort if you don't use too much. And so after I've applied the thread locking agent, I just back the screw into its hole to make sure the agent gets all in the good spaces. I'll do the same thing to the base side while I'm here. That was maybe a little bit too much. You don't need a lot. You just need just a little bit. Just a little bit where I'll back the thread locking agent in to the receptacle. And that should be good. Now this takes a little time to dry. So we'll have plenty of workable time here before it gets too hard to turn. That's not such a big concern. But as I said, it's a good idea not to use too much of this stuff because if you do, uh, it is a mess. It is really difficult to free up those screws. You just need a little dab and that'll be enough to keep screws from working their way loose. You don't want to permanently freeze it. You don't want to use red, blue or green. That's the stuff. All right, we are strung up. Neck alignment looks really good. Strings are equally far away from the edge of the fretboard. So that is a good sign. I'm gonna reinstall the vibrato arm and get this grub screw in place so that the arm stays a little bit more in place as well. All right, now we're all strung up. It's time to check how the vibrato is doing and I'm suspecting not very well because we haven't done much to it. It's not zeroing out unless I pull up. So what we're gonna do to solve this issue, we're going to grab some tri-flow lubricant. This is something that Stu Max sells that's really good for tuners that have seized, etc. And I'm just going to place a few drops right on the knife edge, the area where the posts and the bridge plate meet. It's always a good idea to lubricate wherever you've got metal on metal. Friction. Ooh! That's already helping. That is already making an immense difference. So yes, as always, any place that you've got metal on metal contact, you've got friction, you've got binding, it's just a good idea to lube up those contact points. Except on the bridge. Do not, under any circumstances, lubricate and offset bridge, unless it's like a mastery or something fixed that doesn't tilt. The reason being is that you actually want friction between the strings and the saddles on this bridge because that's how it's meant to work. It pivots along with the vibrato. 
And so if you lubricate that area of contact, well, the bridge slips around, it doesn't stay put, it doesn't come back into tune. <laughs> That's pretty impressive so far, how much of a difference that made. But the other crucial difference that we're going to address here is the height of the cigar. Now, the height of the cigar is somewhat of a contested topic. There are a lot of opinions about how high it should be to work properly, and I'm fine with that. I think that's good that we're all talking about it, at least. I have found over many years of experimentation uh, and setups that the cigar needs to be a little bit lower than it is right now to function perfectly. And I'll, I'll try to explain why I'm not sure I quite understand. Basically, the cigar height is just another mechanism we have to adjust spring tension. So as I lower it, I imagine that we're increasing tension just a little bit on the strings. So if I lower it just a bit to stabilize it, sometimes it's hard to find that screw. God, that is loud. You'll notice that the tuning has changed. That's not bad. We are getting there. Action is a bit high. Yeah, this is working out. I'm gonna need to tighten that neck just a little bit more, but we'll see. Let me lower the bridge and see what we're working with. Certainly we don't need the bridge quite that high. I didn't really do that intentionally. Just the byproduct of me working the Loctite into the screw grooves. Ah, that's much more playable. Still high. Much more playable though. I'm just gonna check that the strings are staying put. And the saddles do have some lateral movement that I don't like, but the Japanese bridge has a different spacing between the saddles, which means there's always going to be space between them, and that is, that is really frustrating for me personally, uh, and for a lot of you, I imagine. Uh, it's, a, it's a flaw in the Japanese design, I believe, that the string spacing is wider than the saddles themselves. So, yeah. So that's never going to be completely fixed without altering the bridge or changing out to a new one. It also isn't the world's biggest problem, so if you've got a little bit of lateral movement, don't fret too much about it. The strings aren't stretched yet. Uh, the nut is still binding a little bit, but it's already so much better than it was when we started. I think this is gonna work out just fine. Don't content ID me. And just then I got a call from the mechanic. And the car? Well, it's gonna be cheaper than we expected. So hey, good news all day long. So I have run my files through the nut slots to make sure that the string can pass through easily, just making sure that the slots are sized correctly for the string gauge used and Oh, so much better already. I'm gonna clean it up a little bit more and then I uh, think we're gonna plug it in and see what we think.
I don't know about you, but I call that a complete success. I think this came out really great. I think Tony's going to be happy. I think Port is going to love his super playable, way more stable guitar. Uh, this thing came out great. And as I said at the beginning of the video, the Mustang Vibrato, it works so well as long as it's set up correctly. If you happen to have some tuning and stability issues of your own with the Fender Dynamic Vibrato on a Mustang or a Jagstang or what have you, anything with this Vibrato, it is my sincere hope that this video gives you a few places to start when it comes to setup and taming the stability of this Vibrato. I know it can be a frustrating experience, but believe me, there is hope. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I do hope you're taking care of yourself and each other, and I'll see you in the next video. Hey, shout out to Loctite. Maybe you want to sponsor this channel because I use this stuff more than just about anybody. And I'm a big, big fan. I'll sell out. Just give me some Loctite. Let's do the thing.